1914 and Europe is itching for a war. A complex web of alliances exists between countries which ensures military help in the case of an attack. On June the 28th, a Serbian nationalist assassinates the Archduke of Austria-Hungary, Franz Ferdinand. Okay, now pretend that's Franz Ferdinand and this is the car that he was sitting in. Dramatic recreation. <laughs> yep, that's about how it went down in 1914. And Austria-Hungary is just a little bit peeved. They send a list of demands to Serbia, which is ultimately refused. And as such, Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. Through the web of alliances, two sides emerge. The central powers, including Germany and Austria-Hungary, and the Triple Entente, being France, the United Kingdom, and Russia. This causes the main brunt of the fighting to be between Germany and Russia in the east, and Germany versus the UK and France in the west. So, to summarize the conflict, a Serbian shot an Austrian, so the British are fighting the Germans in France. Fast forward four years, and the Allies win World War I! Hooray! But they impose a crushing war debt on Germany, effectively destroying their economy and causing massive inflation. But then an angry mustache man comes along, blaming a certain group of people for Germany's defeat in World War I, and says he can fix everything. He takes complete control of Germany and starts eating Eastern Europe for breakfast, which includes Austria, uh, Czechoslovakia, parts of Russia, and Poland. He also commits some genocide along the way. Now, the UK, France, and Russia go to war with Germany and the Axis powers, who turn around and obliterate the French in just 46 days, making almost the entirety of Europe into Hitler's personal goose-stepping, superiority complex-inducing, cocaine-filled playground. However, the US eventually gets dragged into the war following Japan's miscalculated raid on Pearl Harbor. With the help of Uncle Sam, the Allies eventually turn the tide of the war, and on April 30th, 1945, when in a shocking turn of events, Adolf Hitler assassinates Adolf Hitler. And with the end of the Second World War, people can finally focus on their favorite leisure activities like racism, watching a silent movie, or complaining about the good old days. However, an often overlooked key player in this victory over the Nazis is none other than our good friend, Rubber! Planes, trains, automobiles, life rafts, gas masks, and more. Rubber was a crucial material in World War II, but oh no, the Japanese have invaded Southeast Asia and have taken 90% of rubber production with them. How will the Michelin Man get his sweet, sweet tires now? Well, the answer is synthetic rubber. Synthesized in a lab, fueled by Uncle Sam's insatiable desire for resources, and it actually works like the real thing. This wonder material allowed the allies to continue to produce necessary items, which ultimately contributed to a swifter end of the war. Okay, now let's move on to actually getting credit for this assignment. You may be asking yourself, Alec, how does this relate at all to material science? Well, my boy, it's a material that we use science to create. Pretty self-explanatory. Okay, but how was this issue ultimately solved? Uh, pure, unadulterated, innovative genius, that's how. Now let's keep it moving, I've got places to be. How does this relate to course content? Well, through some fancy science words I'll pretend to understand, as said by a company called Apple Rubber. Quote, synthetic rubber comes from catalyzing monomers from cracked hydrocarbons. These monomers are polymerized to form long chains. Uh, end quote. Now, I know we've talked about polymers in class. It was even on the exam, I think. If that's not relating to course content, I don't know what is. Well, that about does it for rubber. I'll leave you with a dramatic recreation of the Allies beating up Hitler and Mussolini. <laughs> 